Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. My brothers and sisters, inshallah, we're going to give this next talk in two parts. This week and next week, a two-part series. And it's still quite short. We're talking about the family system in Islam. And we want to talk about the relationships, the rights and the boundaries between each other. Because many people have asked so many questions about relationships and families, rights and boundaries. And honestly, brothers and sisters, the entire community is based on the family unit. And the family unit is made up of members. And if those members do not have a healthy relationship, a family does not have a healthy relationship, it affects the entire society, the entire community. And it causes problems, mental problems, issues in our youngsters who are growing up. People end up with terrible, dysfunctional families that have a ripple effect throughout generations. Experts say if a family is dysfunctional, it has an effect on the fourth generation before something can be changed. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf, describing those orphans in one of the stories, and orphans, it's a long story, but Allah talks about their great-great-great-grandfather. The ulama say that they were, he was the seventh generation grandfather and he was a righteous man. That also righteousness and a healthy family unit has a ripple effect generations down, seventh generation down. The family, brothers and sisters, has a huge emphasis in Islam. And it is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called in the Quran the following word. He called it Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahim. And the word Ar-Rahim literally means the womb. The reason why it's called the womb is because in Islam a family is defined as those who directly and indirectly share a common womb, which is the mother. So those who are connected to that womb. Also the womb is called Rahim because of Allah's name Ar-Rahman. There is one hadith, I'm not sure of its authenticity, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named Ar-Rahim after his name Ar-Rahman. Nevertheless, the word Ar-Rahim comes from the root word mercy, compassion, kindness. Allah says in Surah Al-Ra'ad verse 21, وَالَّذِينَ يَصِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ وَيَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ وَالَّذِينَ يَصِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَن يُوصَلَ وَيَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ وَيَخَافُونَ سُوءُ الْحِسَابِ I'll recite that verse again, inshaAllah. وَالَّذِينَ يَصِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَن يُوصَلَ وَيَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ وَيَخَافُونَ وَيَخَافُونَ سُوءَ الْحِسَابِ So Allah says, those who join together the ties which Allah has bidden to be joined, who fear their Lord and dread lest they are subjected to severe reckoning. Meaning that they fear the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they cut off the ties of kinship which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered them to connect. In Sahih Muslim, it is narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the rahim, the rahim, which means the family ties, there is something called the Rahim, the origin which Allah created, which connects families together. He said, Ar Rahim, family relations, is connected to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it says, who, and it says, whoever connects me, Allah will connect them to himself. And whoever cuts me off, Allah will cut them off from himself. In another hadith also, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation. And when he completed the creation, the rahim, 
He also created the family ties. The Rahim said, O oh my Lord, this position you have given me is extremely sensitive and important and grand, very sensitive. And I fear that people are going to rip me apart. And Allah said to the Rahim, Yes, how about if I please you with this? That whoever connects you, I connect to me. And whoever cuts you apart, I will cut them from my relationship, from me. Then the Prophet وسلم, recited the verse, فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فَأَصَمَّهُمْ وَأَعْمَى أَبْصَارَهُمْ In Surah Muhammad verse 22 and 23. Allah says, now if you, and this is directed to the hypocrites at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now if you hypocrites turn away, perhaps you would then spread corruption throughout the land and sever your ties of kinship. These are the ones who Allah has condemned, deafening them and blinding their eyes. Brothers and sisters, when we cut off our family ties, everybody feels it. The children feel it. The grandchildren feel it. The siblings feel it. The mothers and fathers feel it. Everyone who's connected to them, they feel it. And a person becomes lost. They suffer mental illnesses. They start to go into traumatic experiences in life. And then it spills onto their own relationships later on. Their relationships start to get cut off. Why? Because it has a detrimental effect. Your identity, which Allah created you in with your mother and father and your siblings and who you are, is the strongest identity you have in this world. And if we rip that apart and don't look after it, then we destroy our inner selves, our identity as it is. That's why the stronger the relationship we have with someone, the more painful and tra traumatic and torturous it is when we disunite. Whether in death, but at least death we understand, it's death. But the worst is when you're in the life and you love each other and you're living and then overworldly matters, or because of ego, or because of our own personal wants, we begin to abuse one another within our family. There is no pain. There is no pain. And there is no hurt worse than when a family member abuses their family. There is no pain or hurt worse than when a family member cuts off their family member, or hurts them or violates their right or acts in violence towards them and so on we all see it and I get stories day in day out my brothers and sisters it doesn't matter who I get it from mothers and fathers I get it from daughters and sons about their parents I get it from siblings against their siblings I get it from nieces and nephews against their uncles and aunts uncles and aunts against their nieces and nephews all of them I get it from everywhere. It's not just one, brothers and sisters. And this means that everyone has to play a part and there are people who are worse than others. It's a family unit has to be collective. From husbands and wives. Wife complains about the husband abusive. The husband complains about the wife being abusive. And the pain and the tears. Wallahi al-azim. Especially the young ones. They, they, they rip my heart apart, subhanAllah. You know, husband and wife, if they... Has a, have a dysfunctional relationship together, each one can still defend themselves in some way. But when they have children, especially little children, those children have nobody to protect them. They can't defend themselves. Sometimes they fight each other over who's going to get custody of them, who's going to win them over. They manipulate them. They talk bad about the other spouse if there is a separation. Even when they're together in the house, abusing one another while the children are watching, what do you think is going to come out from that? Or when they see their parents mistreating their grandparents, and cut him off their grandparents. Some parents, they, I know of stories of parents who force, many, who force their children to cut off their siblings, to cut off their uncles and aunts over worldly matters. Sometimes it's over a word someone said. 
I know families, 10 years, 20 years, they don't know that they actually have an uncle or an aunt. Some of them didn't even know they have a sibling. And the parents knew. Over personal desires. Yes, there are exceptions. There are some people where the harm is so great and there's violence, they have a need to disunite. And we'll come to that, inshallah, I'll tell you how, when this is permissible. But let us talk about the foundations first. We said that in Islam, the family is made up of family members who are connected to the shared womb. Some are closer than others, and some have rights and boundaries more restricted than others. So you have rights, they have rights, there are boundaries they cannot enter upon you. They have boundaries you cannot cross. Each individual, Allah has given them rights, boundaries, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not make anybody a controller or an owner of anyone else. Parents don't own their children. You don't own your children. Some parents tell me, that child is mine, I own them. No, you don't. Allah owns them. They are a trust. That we, are look, we have to look after. Allah gave them to us. Sometimes we feel that we own our siblings. Sometimes we feel we own our own parents. I've seen that. A child goes and gets married. I've seen it many times. Sometimes the mother thinks she controls and owns her son. Take him away from his wife. Some parents have this culture that if the son gets married, they must live with the parents and look after them. And the wife have, has no right to her own home. This is all haram and depression. Some people feel they own their children so much that they think that they're supposed to listen to their parents on who their parents choose they should marry. And they use the religious texts to tell them that if you don't obey me to marry that girl or that boy, to their son or to their daughter, then I'll invoke Allah's anger upon you. I will tell you, brothers and sisters, if you're a parent, and inshallah you're not like that, that this dua, if you make that, you are the one who is in sin. Because Allah does not accept a dua where it is oppression. Allah, Rasul said, that Allah said in Hadith Al-Qudsi, which is in Bukhari, He said, إِنِّي حَرَّمْتُ الظُّلْمَ عَلَى نَفْسِي وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ حَرَامٍ Allah said, I have made oppression forbidden upon myself. Allah said this. And I made it haram among you. So do not oppress one another. Allah is the one who gave the child the right to marry whom they choose, so long as whom they choose is within the Islamic boundaries. Their parents can give them advice. Their parents can say, you know, son, daughter, I recommend this person. But to force them to marry someone, invoke Allah's wrath upon them, this goes against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah will not accept a dua that goes against what He commanded or allowed. And if you do that, we're going to talk about it. We'll show you how you'll destroy your relationship with your children anyway. Children who mistreat their parents, as soon as they get older, they can't wait to take their revenge again. You watch when your children see you. And how they're going to treat you when they see mum and dad treating grandparents like that. Because the children, especially when they're little, they look at their mum and dad and they think everything they do is right. So if they see the mum or dad abusing or swearing or disrespecting their grandmother or their grandfather, even if the grandmother or grandfather are harsh, but if they see their mum or dad abusing them, then they're going to think, as soon as my mom, mom or dad become harsh, I'll also abuse them, I'll also swear at them, I can't wait till they get older and I'll throw them and I'll do this and that. They say, monkey, see, monkey do. Isn't that correct? And that is why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith al-sahih, burru aba'akum taburrukum abna'ukum. Be good to your parents or show goodness to your parents, your children will show you goodness. That's because they're watching. I know that some people, they think, my parents don't deserve that. Brother and sister, you need to break that cycle because otherwise you will be playing also a role in continuing that cycle. And your children, after you are gone, they'll continue that cycle and on and on and on. 
in the Quran there's a muslah and mufsid. Allah says that in the Quran there are those who fix and those who ruin. We have the ability when we become adults, insha'Allah, to build our health, to get support, insha'Allah, learn our deen and break that cycle. What's the problem with that? Allah is going to judge every single person for what they did. Allah will judge the parents if they betrayed the trust which He gave them, which are their children. Allah will judge the children if they betrayed the trust towards their parents. Allah will judge the siblings if they betrayed the trust with their siblings. Allah will judge the husband and wife against each other. Listen to what Allah says in Surah Abasa wa Tawalla. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِيهِ On that day, the day of judgment, the person will run away from who? will run away in this order from their brother, from their sibling. Not only that, even from their mother, even from their father, that's what the verses mean, even from their wife and husband, and even from their children. For every person will be a matter that they are concerned about. What does this verse mean and why is it in this order? Because, brothers and sisters, naturally in life, the closest people to you in life are your children. They are the closest and the ones you love the most. Don't tell me you love your parents more than your children. It's natural that we love our children even more than our parents. That's just natural. And they are the closest to us. That's why some parents feel they can control them and own them and never let them live their life. Subhanallah. The next in closeness is the husband and wife. That's if they're still together. They live most of their life together. They're close. They share most of their life together. They're raising those children together. Next, naturally, is your father and mother in closeness. Because once you get married, your mother kind of lives with her, still with your father if she's alone or your other siblings help you. But you have to move on and live a life and, and have less contact with them than you had when you were single. And your brother, your brother and sister, because... It's known that the brother is a support. So you will run away from all of these. Why? Because Allah is going to question us about their rights. And he's going to question them about our rights. Can you imagine that? The child saying, my parents whom you entrusted with, oh my Lord, they did this to me and that to me. If the parents have truly oppressed the child knowingly, knowingly, are they going to use the verse with Allah? Your Lord is the creed that you worship none other but Him. And to be good to your parents? No. So we've got to be careful with that. Are the children going to use the excuse they type on the internet? You've got to be very careful what you say, brothers and sisters, about your parents. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He knows exactly what went on, if you're not truthful and you're not honest, then Allah's going to judge you too. He is just and fair. And so on. The siblings, everything. Sometimes the siblings, when do they really disunite? In two ways I found in society. In our community, in two ways. Number one, or actually in all communities. The first way is when their parents die and the inheritance comes to play. The siblings fight. This is number one, top of the list. The amount of enmities over property and money is absurd. They become enmity. Some of them even kill each other. I've seen it happen here and abroad. Mostly abroad where there are less laws to protect them too. And some, some of them when they get married. When they get married, either the husband, the new husband or the new wife play a role in disuniting the families. I've seen this happen a lot. Over things that are quite worldly. So we need to marry people who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, who are the Rahim people? Let me enumerate them. The scholars differed in three different views. They said the family in Islam, whom you owe rights to and they owe to you, are 
the ones who are only mahram. Remember we discussed mahram the other day, the ones who you can never ever marry. They are the only ones who are your family of rahim, whom you owe the rights to. And this is the opinion of the Hanafi school of thought and one of the views of the Maliki. And all the scholars agree at least on that. The others, they said, it is those who inherit you. Those who inherit you, there's a big list, they also your rahim. And others, they said, they are the mahrams plus everyone related to your father and mother. In the Hanbali school of thought, they said, all the way to the fourth generation grandfather. So everyone connected from the fourth great grandfather downwards are all your family. Nevertheless, brothers and sisters, I won't, I'm not a mufti or knowledgeable enough to tell you which one's correct, which one's not. In fact, the scholars have differed on this. But what I can tell you is that what they all agreed upon minimum is that your family in Islam, whom you owe the rights to, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid to cut off, at least, at least, at least, they are the ones who you are forbidden from ever marrying. That's the minimum. And of course, whatever you can offer more for the others, they come secondary. For example, uh, the so let's go through them. They are your mother and father and your grandparents and above. They are your children and grandchildren and below. They are your siblings. They are your uncles and aunts. They are your nephews and nieces. And the rest of them are your cousins. So all the ones on the top, mum, dad, grandparents, children, grandchildren, siblings, uncles, aunts, nephews, niece, they are all forbidden to marry. So these are no doubt rahim. As for the cousins, such as your uncle's son, your auntie's daughter, uh, all those people, maybe they are rahim according to that view, maybe they're not. But as I said before, the scholars consider, some scholars consider they are because they are connected to your mum and dad. Nevertheless, brothers and sisters, we are people of goodness and mercy and connecting with them is also virtuous and good. And plus, your children, they want to know their cousins. Your children, they want to know your cousins. Who is their bloodline? The more you have a connection with people who are connected to your brothers and sisters, the more you have a relationship, the more your children actually feel that they belong in this world. And I don't know if you noticed, I noticed from my own kids, that when they see more family members around from both mum and dad's side, and anyone else who you say, that's my cousin, not the Lebanese way, we think everybody's our cousin. It's true because if you're from the village, apparently we have this great-grandfather who came and settled in the village and we we're all born from there. You know, mashallah, I have a lot of kids up in the village. But I mean like real cousins. Your children feel proud. They feel amazing. They feel, wow, I belong in this world more. I've got more people that, that support me and sort of my cousins. Anyway, brothers and sisters, that's basically what, the, what they are. What about the husband and wife? The husband and wife are not called rahim. Because you are not related by the womb. You are husband and wife. And your relationship together is extremely important and sanctified. That is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a bond with in order to protect the children and family. You are a cell. The father and mother, the husband and wife are the nucleus of the family. You break that nucleus, everything else gets broken. And in fact, brothers and sisters... The financial livelihood upon the husband in the first degree is the right of the children and his wife before even his mother and father. Did you know that? The financial right. Because the children and the wife are reliant and dependent on the husband. It is not the responsibility of the grandparents and so on to look after them financially, it is the husband or the father's responsibility. But your responsibility towards your parents comes after them because your children are the main ones dependent on you and your wife as a husband. The wife is not responsible for finances for, towards anybody. Anybody. Not her husband, not her children, not her parents, not her siblings. But the man is. But nevertheless, brothers and sisters, you try to give each one their rights within your capacity. We're talking about people who are very, very poor and all they could afford is to look after just their children and their wife and they don't have any more. Even if they don't eat themselves, they don't have enough. Try to serve your mother and father if they're in need, but in general, your wife and your children are absolutely dependent on you in Islam, even if, and we're talking about 
when they don't have anything. So, brothers and sisters, there are, there's a system in Islam that is perfectly designed that really looks after the family. Brothers and sisters, let's move on, inshallah. We talked about the dysfunctional family. Now we're going to get a little bit heated. The dysfunctional family is of five types. If you have this type of family, you know someone has this type of family, they need help. Number one, the substance abuse family. They are the family who take drugs. They are the family who are addicted to addictions, alcohol, and so on. In fact, alcoholism is the number one or the first, one of the highest five uh, top causes of domestic violence in the world. Drugs and intoxicants. So substance abuse family is dysfunctional family. The conflict-driven family. What's a conflict-driven family? They fight over everything. When you go into their house, all you hear is screams, shouting, blame, accusations. They slam their doors, for example. They fight over remote control, TV remote control. They fight over an iPad, a laptop, a piece of glass. This is a dysfunctional family, it's a high conflict family. What does a high conflict family breed? It breeds severe mental illnesses in children, and these children grow up not able to hold their own relationships. This is a study. This is great research done in this. Examples are bipolar disorders, uh, uh, borderline personality disorders, uh, hist histrionic disorders. There are so many disorders that happen as a result of high conflict families. They cannot keep a job, they cannot keep a relationship, they're always paranoid, anxiety. The other family, dysfunctional family, is the violent family. Violent. You go to their house, all you hear are things being broken, shattered. You find holes in the walls, you find holes in the doors, there are bruises. There's always someone running away. Subhanallah. The violent family. That's a dysfunctional family, these children will grow up. These children, brothers and sisters, will run away and find their identity somewhere else. They will hate themselves and hate the day that they were born. That's how they are. And the other one is the authoritarian family. The family that thinks that the only way to function in a family is as if you've got an authority with only rules. No one, the, the authority rules, but there's no listening, there's no giving and taking. There's no conversing, there's no laughter, it's just rules. Authoritarian, it's only one-way direction. This is a dysfunctional family even in Islam. And lastly, the emotionally detached family. They're the family who don't have this emotional bond. You find, for example, the father's in the car, or the mother driving to school, driving somewhere. They hardly say a word to each other. If they do, it's all about rules and superficial things. And these types, they got... The majority of the modern-day families are, if you go to their houses, this is the emotionally detached family, you'll find mainly two types of scenarios, mainly. I'm not saying everybody, but mainly. Number one, either it is a household where it's always study, 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 and school. They go to school, they come back from school, there's still school at home. Kids can't get any sleep, there's no fun, study, 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 night and day. School. So the parent is like a teacher all the time. Or it's a family of just entertainment, neglect. Always on their devices. There's nothing to do. Mum and dad are on their phone. The other child's on the TV or they're on their iPads or they're on something night and day. Just entertainment. Go on holidays, come back. Some of them have their argila and shisha in the house. Uh, you know what that is, right? Musalsalat uh, after Musalsalat, which is like series after series on TV. Sometimes we stay up till 2 a.m. And then we say we've got no time for our kids, we're tired. Brothers and sisters, this is a dysfunctional family. One of the ways to make a functional family is to try and get back to natural human behavior, and that is eat, eat together. Eat together, it is a sunnah. When you eat together, you converse together and put your devices away. Rasul said there is blessing in eating together. And it brings you closer. The only people, the only creatures who don't eat together and they eat alone are beasts and animals like the wolves. Each one wants their own little, they snatch it away. 
the lions, they come and fight. They have to snatch it away. Nobody cares about anyone. And they consume each other, like Allah gives the example of the spider, spider's family. There are species of spiders, when the female becomes pregnant, it's, it's bigger than the male. It becomes pregnant, the male mates with it, then the female spider turns on the male and eats the male, eats her husband. Why? For nourishment. Then when the babies are born from the spider, the mother has to run away. Why? Because the babies gang on the mother and eat her for nourishment. Then the other little spiders have to disperse because as they grow, it becomes like a surviving, survival mode. Each spider, when it gets hungry, it looks at, at its sibling and it wants to eat its sibling. So they disperse. That's why Allah says, In Surah Al-Ankabut, the most dysfunctional and separated and divided family is the family of the, of the spider. Because the, in the time of the Prophet they used to observe this. They knew this about the spider family. It's, it's a particular species that do it. And that's that, <laughs> humans who do that, subhanAllah, they're like that. So brothers and sisters, let us talk quickly about the rights of children. I want to start with the children. Why do I want to start with the children? Because the first things Allah gives us are our children. And the most vulnerable and dependent and weakest are the children. And Allah gives them to us like a clear blank page. We fill them up. You either fill them with good or bad or whatever you like. Abidin. And Allah says in the Quran, Allah commands you and reminds you about your children. About your children. Rasul said, You are all shepherds and each one is responsible for their flock. The Prophet peace be upon him said, In Sahih Muslim, your child has rights against you, O mother and father. Your child has rights against you. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, just like, your, just like your parents have rights, just like your parents have rights against you, also your child has rights against you as well. The hadith in Al-Adab al-Mufrad, Bukhari. So one of the first rights, I'll go through them quickly insha'Allah. One of the first rights of a child that you have is choosing a good mother or good father to marry. So that's before they're even born. Because whoever you marry is going to play a role in raising that child. So you must make the choice based on a good parent insha'Allah. Number two, when a child is born, it's called tahniq. Tahniq is a sunnah that when a baby is born, it's a sunnah, it's recommended, not compulsory. You get a tiny bit of date, a little date, put it in your mouth, mix it with your saliva. Father, for example, or the mother, mix it a little bit. Get a little tiny bit from your saliva, not the actual date, the saliva. Don't shove a date down its throat, you'll kill it. Baby is born in the hospital, get a tiny bit of your saliva that's mixed with the date sweets. In the hospital, for example. And don't do it as soon as the baby comes out. Doctors need to take care of the baby. Just take it easy. You don't have to go quickly, all right? Wait until everybody's settled, mum's settled, baby's settled. In the crib, everything's nice. And put a little bit around its mouth, inside, um, all around its mouth. And dates give a little bit of energy and, and uh, nu nutrition to the baby. If you don't have any dates, then anything sweet is, is good as well. So a little bit of glucose and, and all that. While the mother is pregnant, it is the husband's role to help her and support her and assist her and be there for her. For the mother's stress and her depression and her anxieties and how she feels directly affects the baby that is in her womb. If she's happy, the child's happy. If she's stressed, the, father, the child is stressed, subhanAllah, the baby, the fetus. What she eats goes into the baby, and it takes also hormones that are secreted. So if she's got serotonin, which is a happy hormone, the child, the baby has it as well. If it's stress hormones, the baby also gets it, subhanAllah. So brothers and sisters, be very careful of that. Another right of the child is that on the seventh day, this is also a recommended sunnah, it's not compulsory, that on the seventh day, you name the child. And that gives the husband and wife time to rest and relax and decide what name they want to name it. If you've already got a name before they are born, it's okay. But 
If you don't, Islam gives you, says it's recommended on the seventh day to name the child, to do a aqiqah, which means to slaughter a sheep. You can do one or two for both the boy and girl, not a problem. Uh, yes, I know there's some hadiths which say two for the boy, one for the girl. Uh, but there are also other hadiths where Aisha radiallahu did one for each while Hassan and Hussein, or Prophet ordered for one for each, Hassan and Hussein, and so on. So you can do one for each, boy and girl. Shaving their hair, but shaving their hair is only for the boy, only for the boy, not the girl. What is the wisdom behind that? Allah only knows. But perhaps, maybe one day we can discover scientifically that the hair that's on the, on, the, on the baby, maybe the boy different to the girl, has some kind of uh, circumstance or exception while it's in the um, uh, embryonic fluid inside the mother's womb. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he saw a boy with his hair just being born and he said, Amitul Adha, take off the harm. So that little bit of hair, Rasulullah ﷺ called it harm. It's a minor harm, not a major harm. Something about it, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it there, is a wisdom. It is also a sunnah recommended to circumcise the boy. Circumcision is, a, is wajib even. It's, some say it's a highly recommended sunnah, but the majority opinion of the scholars is that it is wajib. It is a must. And Allah knows best, but perhaps that extra piece of skin on the boy's um, thing, the, the baby, plays a role in protecting the baby inside of the mother's womb, the embryonic fluid that's around it. There is wisdom behind it, inshallah. It's not established scientific fact yet. I'm just saying I've read some studies about the hair and about the, uh, the child the, uh, not being circumcised. When they come out, it is better to circumcise them and better for their health. That's another whole scientific story which I don't have time to go through, inshallah. Uh, also, it is the first thing you should do with your child between the age of zero to four years old, mostly, in fact, I'll say zero to eight years old. The child needs the mother more than the father. Sisters, I want you to remember this. Not Muslims, but also experts, non-Muslim experts, tell us between zero to eight years, a boy and a girl needs their mother more than the girl. So if a mother is a career-driven woman, please remember, if you're going to be a mother, prioritize. In this day and age, we have this idea of competing between men competing, women competing with men in the career arena. We see it. And the, the ones who are neglected are the children. Who's raising those children? So think about the children as nothing greater and more honorable than raising a human being. He or she is yours, and that child needs its mother. And I've mentioned before that in the first two years, a baby, when it cries, the mother lactates. It means it produces milk just by hearing the baby crying. So there's a, there's a strong connection. And till eight years old, the, the, the child naturally latches to its mother. Man, for crying out loud, even the, the 15, 16 year old boys, when I take them to Umrah, students from our school, we go every year. And when I'm there on the last day, I just do a test. Every year I do a test. I go, who do you miss more, mum or dad? 15, 16 year old boys. They go, mum, I miss mum. I said, okay, all right, what about you? And rarely do I hear a boy say, I miss dad. So brothers and sisters, a, a, a child needs their mother a lot. And these are the crucial years. Those four years, especially in the beginning, take it easy on the child. Don't yell at them. Don't scream at them. Don't shake them. I know stories, subhanAllah, many, many, many here and overseas. I once entered the court, Islamic court, and a mother... A mother's child was taken out of hospital and she, it was a crime. She had slapped her child and his eardrum was punctured. We, and, and then I realized that th this is very common. They can't restrain their anger. Bash, smack at the young age. How many stories do we hear of shaking the baby and it's dying or throwing it on the floor and so on? So zero to four is a crucial age. You can't blame, age. You can't blame the child. SubhanAllah, take it easy. And have mercy. Uh, obviously the child's right is to teach them halal and haram. As much as you can. Also the right of the child is to teach them at an early age. Maybe at six or seven years old. Tawheed. Which means the oneness of Allah. Before that teach them in a fun way. 
And the best way I've found to teach your children is through conversation and games and playing, not through lecturing, no matter how old they are, especially teenagers. Lecturing doesn't work. Walk with them together, do some activity together. If it's a boy or girl, whatever, you want to do fishing together, whatever you want to do, any hobby, talk while like that, just conversation. Another right of the child is to teach them the Qur'an. And we have, alhamdulillah, apps that are entertaining and playful for your children. Use playful things. There is a, an app which I recommend. It's called Qur'an Era. I put it on my Instagram page. Qur'an Era, very innovative app for Qur'an, for your children. It's got animations and so on, and it's got a very good strategy of teaching your children. Another thing to do with the children with Qur'an is put 15 minutes a day. Tell them, listen, 15 minutes in the start, 15 minutes before you go to sleep. Then reward them for it. Don't use violence. Don't use threats. Don't use big words. Don't use religious texts. Don't. It is my opinion, Wallahu alam, among other, and other scholars have this in experts. And we found it through experience. Because as you know, as a teacher and educator and counselor, I hear these things day in, day out. That before puberty, try not to, to talk about hellfire and judgment day and Allah's anger. Talk about Allah's mercy. Talk about Allah's kindness. Talk about, about Jannah. Talk about the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Talk about this stuff. Let them grow up with a positive mindset at that age. Otherwise, they'll be traumatized. Also, their right is their living needs. We all know that, alhamdulillah. Abusing their living needs, Allah will judge us for it. Very importantly, their right is equality. Equality. Some people, they treat the boy better than the girl. And the other way, some parents, they allow the haram for the boy. Yeah, they should be allowing the haram, they should be disallowing the haram for both of them. They say the girl is haram, but the boy can do haram. The boy can go to nightclubs. I know most of you don't do that, alhamdulillah, but I've heard this growing up. Boy can go to nightclubs. He can go and pick up, he can go and help girlfriends, he can go and commit zina. If he drinks alcohol, it doesn't matter, he'll get better. Boy can do anything. Some cultures are really like that, they're disgusting. As for the girl, the complete opposite. I know of families who they allow in the culture, this is in my culture and other cultures, the boy is allowed to bash his sister and the mother and father will say, yes, he is raising her, he is teaching her, he is disciplining her. Subhanallah, this is called discipline. This is oppression, this is haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge both the parents and the brother. This girl will grow up hating every man. She won't have trust with men. Yani, subhanallah. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he emphasized equality between boys and girls. Between boys and boys, girls and girls, all the siblings. In Sahih Muslim, he said to the father of a Nu'man, who was a father of a young boy, he said to him, an yakunu laka fil birri sawa? Would you like all your children to be equally good to you, not one treating you better than the other, or one treating you worse than the other? He says, yes, Yerusha, I would like all my children to equally treat me good. He said, then if that is what you want, you treat them equally. Show them how it's done. One man entered and he had a, uh, two boys. He had his son on his lap, a Bedouin man. And he put his daughter on the floor when she entered. He put his son on his lap and let his daughter sit on the floor. Rasul Sallallahu said to him, Ma adalt. You did not deal with them equally. He said, How ya Rasul? He said, You put your son on your lap, you put your daughter on the floor. She deserves to be the same as your son. The same. Now I know as they grow up, boys and girls are not the same exactly in their biology in their needs. So now it becomes, it becomes being fair and just to what their needs are. As your child grows older, their needs change. Being, serving them with equality doesn't mean exactly the same. You're not going to treat a 14, 15-year-old like as if he's still, still a 5-year-old. And you're not going to treat the girl who is now 12, 13 like the boy who is 12, 13. They have different needs biologically. The idea of equality is to give them what suits them, but in the same amount. Especially with money. Money, there is no gender inequality. You give the boy the same as the girl, the girl the same as the boy, brother same as his brother, sister same as his sister, according to their age as well, of course. If they're very small, instead you, you, you spend on them. Or you can make a savings and say, okay, I've given 
their older brother or sister this much, I'm going to save for this much. Well, I know a brother, subhanAllah, beautiful father, and that's and, and shows me, I can see it now, why his children are all there for him and their mother. Wallahi. They are there for them and they are so close. Their father never, mistreated, never, never, wallahi, practiced inequality between his children, boys and girls, and he has about nine, nine sons and daughters. It's old school. And wallahi, because of that, they grew up to love their parents. No matter what they do, they will serve them and be good to them. He was equal to them, whether it was university, whether it was um, a car, whether it was a weekly, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, allowance, whether it's clothes, whether it's whatever. So, for example, the girl, you don't buy the same clothes as the boy, but you give her the same equality in what her needs are and what his needs are. You see, brothers and sisters, it's very important. Uh, also, protection and security for them, you protect both of them. And you protect them against each other, the children. You don't allow the boy or the girl to bash the other one, to swear at the other one, to abuse the other one, to spy on the other one. Very importantly, brothers and sisters, is favoritism. It is haram in Islam to favor one above the other. We talked about that. This is equality. And you must be equal with them in giving them skills in life that benefit them and allow them to see their interests and not force upon them. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah says. He says, it is haram, unless they're really tiny children, you know what's best for them. As they get older, especially when they reach puberty, it is haram to force upon your daughter or son who is now independent, so puberty and above, force upon them the exact type of food they have to eat. Now, be careful. I know sometimes they get back from school and the mother has cooked something or the father, and they said, this is what you're going to get. We're not talking about that. Of course, you have to discipline the children to understand that what's cooked in the house, they must eat it and not to be self-entitled. But for example, if uh, something specific you force them to eat when there is an alternative and you say, you must eat that, why? There's no benefit. Just because you must eat it, there's no benefit. If there's benefit, that's fine. But even then, you can't force them. You can only recommend. Otherwise, you will lose your child. Of course, there is harmful substances. So long as they are under your roof as parents, you have the authority over them. But to a certain degree, if something is mubah and allowed and there's no benefit in making forcing them, yani we're talking about parents who want to be controlling. No other purpose except to control. You've got to listen to me and obey me. And that's it. And you have no say even in your taste buds. Give them room for their taste buds, for crying out loud, unless it harms them. Uh, the, the exact color clothing they have to wear, or the exact type of clothing, when there is no other benefit except to control them. You might say to them, wear a jacket, it's cold outside. If your teenage son or daughter, 14, 15, 16, says, look, I'm going to be okay, I don't need to wear a jacket. I could tell them, okay, do. You can just advise them. And then they can learn and have choices. Don't try to be a helicopter parent. And so on. Brothers and sisters, let's finish, inshallah, with these few things that I really want to say, inshallah. My brothers and sisters, what is the most important thing about a parent's upbringing of their child? Number one factor is role modeling. You must be the role model before you can teach them. You must be the role model before you can teach them. You might be saying, what if they're only one year old? Do I have to be a role model? Yes, wallahi al-azim. Studies have shown that a one-year-old child, when they hear their parents fighting or screaming or swearing, the child feels distressed and they cry. Subhanallah. Other than food or whatever. And as they get older, they especially, it is established that now between the age of two and seven years old is where the child develops its identity and character. And it takes it from the parents. If your children are teenagers, you need to be role modeling. You can't tell them one thing and do the other. And here is the thing. Of course, you're, you're a human being. Parents are human beings. If you make a mistake, let your children know you made a mistake. That's how you remedy it. There's nothing wrong with that. Say, or if you shouted at them in the wrong time, or you said something you shouldn't have said, go back and sit them down. Say, look, son, daughter, I, I made a mistake. I'm only human. Nothing wrong with saying, forgive me. Give them a hug if you can. Wallahi, they'll love you more. They'll understand you're human and you make mistakes and it's forgiving. And they'll learn that too from you. So role modeling, my brothers and sisters. Number two is having consistency in your rules and in your promises. 
Don't give them conflicting rules. One minute you're allowed, next minute you don't allow for no other reason, for no reason. They won't respect you. In fact, brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you four aspects that if you do them, you are sure to lose them. Four things you do them, you are sure to lose them. Number one, violence and always getting angry. Violence and always getting angry. Violence is physical, verbal, severely emotional, severely mental, even religious violence. What do I mean by religious violence? Meaning using the text to your advantage when you were not allowed. For example, a parent says to their child, go and steal. I'm just giving you a, a generic example. Otherwise, Allah will be angry with you for not listening to me. A parent says, you've got to marry this person. Otherwise, the anger of Allah is upon you. The parent says, every bit of money you have, you must give it to me. Even if the parent is not in need of it. This is haram. Violence emotionally. Putting them down. Calling them names. Ridiculing them. You are sure to lose your child. Sarcasm. Emotional blackmail. Uh, uh, smacking them. Getting a regular habit of doing these things. Especially if they're older. Throwing or hitting objects. I've seen both mothers and fathers. Fathers will use their fist, they'll break walls or they hit the child. Mothers sometimes they break glass, uh, they throw food on the floor, screaming at the dad, screaming at the dad, screams at the mum, they slam the doors. All of this is violence, brothers and sisters. You are destroying your children this way, if you do that, God forbid. There's even the opposite. It's called the long, silent treatment. Yeah, akhi, speak to your children. Listen to them. Sit down with them. They don't know anybody. They're growing up, they're developing. Brothers and sisters, a sure way to lose them is bad role modeling, as I said, regularly contradicting yourself, dishonest, has no clear rules, fights and puts down spouse, speaks ill of their other parent. Number three, doesn't listen. You only advise, but you don't listen. You only advise, you don't listen. You only lecture, you don't listen. <laughs> it's only your way or the highway. You're going to lose your child. Your child is unheard, and they'll develop low self-esteem. They'll be afraid to talk. They'll think they're a nobody, only rules, and you develop with them a weak personality. They're not going to be able to stand up for themselves. The parent won't admit their mistake. Uh, they won't let the child speak. They won't acknowledge when their child is right. Ooh, you know, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was different to that. He showed his grandchildren in front of them in the masjid. He said, if anybody I've done anything to them, take your right now. A man said, Ya Rasulullah, you smacked my stomach one time. He lifted his shirt and said, take your revenge. In front of his grandchildren. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed. Obviously, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't hurt him. The man ended up kissing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's stomach. But the point is that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu was only 10 to 12 years old. He lived with him for two years. He said, I learned with the Prophet ﷺ and I served him. Wallahi, I never heard him one time. Actually, he stayed with him nine years. He said, Wallahi, not once did I hear the Prophet ﷺ say to me, Oof, or why did you do that? Why would you do that? Why didn't you do that? He never said anything like that. Abadan, never, never put me down. One time he sent him on an errand. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he says, I was about 10. He sent me on, on an errand. And then I got caught up watching children playing. So I forgot about the errand and I'm just watching. Like what a kid does, watching and looking, playing. Because that's what a naturally a kid loves doing. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came around. He says, I heard a man from behind me laughing and smiling and saying, what happened to the errand, Anas? And then uh, I looked around. I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, cheerful. Wallahi, he was like the moon. And I said, I'm going now. And he said, very well, don't worry. You can play. Just do the errand. Easy. Easy. SubhanAllah, my daughter... A few months ago, I remember, I spilt the milk, putting milk, and I spilt it. And I got angry with myself and upset, and I sat on the floor. My daughter holds my hand, and she says to me, it's okay, Bobo. It's, we all make mistakes. <laughs> she was eight years old at the time. I mean, she was uh, she's, uh, nine years old at the time. It's okay, Bobo. We all make mistakes. Just clean it up, and I'll help you. She made more of a mess, but she's helping. It's not a problem. You know, by the way, children, when they muck up things, don't look at it that way. You know, keep away the dangerous stuff away from them. But they're being scientists. They're discovering. They're learning. Sometimes parents, they don't let their child even play in the dirt or the soil. doesn't matter. Let them play in the soil. The soil is clean, brothers and sisters. Oh, they ate a worm. doesn't matter if they ate a worm. 
It's not going to kill them. It also actually builds their immune system. So I believe in this day and age, because of all the rubbish that we, we have around the takeaway and the, and the sheltering our children too much, has developed into all these different uh, allergies that, that we're getting these days. And then, and then there's more vaccines, and they're making more money off us. And be, yeah, no, serious. A child should, is made to play in the dirt and the soil and the sand and put stuff in their mouth. Just keep away the dangerous stuff and keep an eye out of it if they're really small. Let them experiment. We, and I know a lot of you are saying, well, my brother, I wish that was true. Now they're on their gadgets, they're on their devices, they're inside. We want them to go outside. Do your best. You've got to sometimes be firm with them. And don't think that you are being mistreating to them if you take away their devices or you wake them, make that, wake them up a little bit early. Sometimes we have students who are late to school and I'd call the parents and they say, oh, I feel bad waking them up a little bit earlier. I want them to get their beauty sleep. I said, that's not being a good parent. You need to wake them up earlier. Nothing's going to happen to them. They'll be resilient. That's being good parenting. That's good. Allow them to practice and do things by themselves. Not everything you have to do it for them. Otherwise, you'll raise a lazy, self-entitled, obnoxious brat. That's what you're going to raise. So, brothers and sisters, allow them to make mistakes. And lastly, as I said before, favoritism between siblings. Unequal treatment, comparisons. That's what I wanted to say. Never compare your child to their sibling or your child to a cousin or your child to another family friend or another student. Don't ever compare them. You'll find they'll resent you and they won't listen. The best way, to, com if you want to compare a child, compare the child to themselves. You say, for example, you know, Fatima, last time you did this work better. This time you didn't do it very well. Last time you were able to spend more time here. This time you couldn't do it. Compare her to herself. Compare him to himself, not to others. I've seen it many times, children resenting, even older ones. Married, married boys and married men and women, their parents still, they'll say, oh, how come your, your brother is like this? So he says, they resent it, they don't like it, they start fighting. So it's not good to compare them to others. Just compare them to themselves, brothers and sisters. My brothers and sisters, um, lastly and finally, there's so much to say, subhanAllah. It is the right of the child that when they become independent to give them more privacy as they get older. It is not your right to spy on them. Even if you suspect something, talk to them. Talk, don't spy. Don't teach them the, the idea of spying. Let them build the trust. I have five T words. They're called trust, transparency, tolerance, time with them, and talk to them. Trust. This applies to, I use it for married couples, but this applies to everyone, even parents and children. Trust, transparency, time, talk, and tolerance. Knock on their door. Let them know that you, especially if it's a girl, if you have a daughter, knock on her door. Talk to them. Let them know that you do trust them. And if something goes wrong, you will find out and they'll feel even worse. Avoid the five days. Now, lastly, when can parents or children or relatives, arham, cut off each other? Well, Islam did not come to create harm on people. Even the arham, even the family members, there comes a point where they can distance themselves. You can probably love someone from a distance. You can limit your contact with them. And some people, you need to, you need to avoid them altogether. It does happen, especially a highly dysfunctional family. Where, So basically, the scholars limited it to a very small, narrow place. And that's in relation to, if, if they're very close to you, very narrow. They are based on violating five human rights which the Sharia has come to protect. Five. If there is danger to your religion, obviously, alhamdulillah, here in Australia, we don't have much of that. Overseas, maybe there is danger to yourself because of your religion. If your family wants to persecute because of your religion, you're allowed to distance or cut them off if that's the case. Number two, if there is danger to your dignity and honor, an example is sexual abuse. Number three, if there is danger to your property, usually if you're an adult, usually it's, it's for adults, not for children, danger to your property. They destroy it. There's harmful stuff to your property. You're allowed to distance in a way that protects your property. Danger to your body. There's severe harm. There's severe hitting. There's bashing. There's bruising. There's abusing. A person has to distance themselves or get someone to help them. 
And lastly, their mind, such as drug abuse, severe, severe mental abuse, severe mental abuse, to the point where they can no longer, they're going to harm themselves. Something's going to happen. Something's going to go wrong. And my advice to you, brothers and sisters, is don't run away too far. Go to a family member, go to a relative, go to a cousin if you are in severe danger like this. Make sure it's real, it's not made up. If there's real danger to you, a person can distance themselves. Uh, but my advice is try to get to a distance where you're safe, but not completely cut off, because things can change. I also say it to parents. Some parents, they don't want their kids around. Like, for example, let's say there's drug abuse. They find their child is addicted to drugs, and they bring it into the house. They're, they're, they're harming their brothers and sisters. They're causing havoc. I said to some parents once, call the police, get them out. But it's my son, it's my daughter. That's the only way you're going to help them. Otherwise, your entire children are going to suffer. They said, oh yeah, I said, now focus on your other children. This person addicted to drugs, you can't do anything. They're going to ruin the entire family. Call the police, they'll arrest them. Doesn't matter, they're going to look after them. They'll give them rehab, they'll get them off it, inshallah. But I said, keep a line between you and them. Never cut them off completely. You know, never know what happens. So it's not all or none. This is what I'm trying to say. Some people, they say, cut off completely. Or it's all or nothing. No, brothers and sisters. When it, there's no utopia in a family. There's no perfect family. And it's not all or nothing. Keep a little line between you. Have some communication. Finally, brothers and sisters, uh, yani the, the, the arham, the relatives in the family, what does it mean to connect your ties? It means that the Sharia didn't say exactly how to do it, but things that people are used to and know. You call them, you send a text, you ask about them, you send your salam, say, give my salams to so-and-so. You may visit them, uh, you may send them a gift, you may invite them. Uh, you, it doesn't have to be regular every day. You know, you don't have to, some people, they don't have to see their relatives every month even. Some of them see them on Eid. Because family, if it's very big, you're not going to be able to fulfill all the responsibilities. So if you do all that, inshallah, it's fine. And if you can't do that and you really can't connect with someone, I tell you there are six things that is a right of a Muslim against another Muslim. The six things are minimum. Number one, if you can do them. Number one, if they say salamu alaykum to you, say wa alaykum as salam. Easy. Number two, if they're around somehow, let's say you're at a wedding together or I don't know, somehow you're together, you saw them, these people you don't talk to from your relatives, let's say they sneezed. And they said, Alhamdulillah, you should say, Allah. Perhaps that will create some mercy. Number three, if they happen to ask you for sincere advice, and you know that by giving them advice, it's not going to cause any harm, give them advice if you can. Number four, if they invite you to a marriage, a walima, and you're able to attend, attend, even if it's a short time, or at least respond and say, I can't make it. Or send a message that you can't make it, if there's going to be harm from it. Number five, if they get sick, ask about them, or at least check on them, even with a text message or a card or anything. Even if they rip it up, doesn't matter, you've done a little duty. And lastly, if they die, attend their funeral. So brothers and sisters, this is the absolute minimum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our families and our children. Today we focused a little bit on generally the family, and we focused on the rights of the children, and a little bit about the parents. Inshallah, brothers and sisters, next class... We will go through quickly. I'm going to talk about the parents because everybody knows the rights of the parents, mashallah, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. And we're going to talk about the siblings. It'll be quick. We're going to talk about the uncles and aunts. That'll be very quick. We're going to talk about your cousins. It'll also be quick. And I'm going to take time to talk about the in-laws, so the spouses and the in-laws. And I want to spend a bit more time on that, inshallah, next week, maybe 20 minutes on the other stuff and about 20 minutes on the in-laws, the spouses, um, insha'Allah ta'ala. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Somebody 